so then I welcome all the participants to this um, webinar with Cable Green. Um, I'd like to um, ask all of you to share your uh, contributions and, and any questions you have via the chat function. You see the little speech bubble in the lower left corner. Um, so please use the chat for any questions or contributions you have or anything you may want to share. Um, and with that, I want to turn over to the moderator of the virtual conference, uh, Robert Scuber from the Netherlands, um, who also, together with Ben Janssen, Janssen who is also here, um, did the big study on OER and TVET. And with that, I'd like to and give the word to Robert. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Max. Well, also welcome uh, <coughs> to all to you all. Uh, also on behalf of Ben, and as um, as, as Max already said, uh, Ben and myself have done uh, the study on use of OER and TVET and uh, uh, delivered a draft report, which was presented uh, in the. Um, in the uh, second OER World Congress in Ljubljana. And this uh, virtual conference is actually to inform you about specific topics in this study and also to collect uh, information from you to involve this in the final report. The final report we uh, uh, have to be, it has to be delivered at the end of this month, so on the 30th of November, and it is aimed to be published in December of this year. So the, the final report will be available uh, very soon. Uh, uh, so this year is, is be aimed. And we've uh, defined the five topics of in this uh, virtual conference. And the first topic is about the importance of openness. Um, and there are two aspects on openness, actually. This is free, so uh, without paying, having to pay any money access uh, to, uh, to, for instance, uh, learning resources, but also to have as a user certain rights that you, under conditions, can change or reuse or uh, remix or redistribute the reuse the uh, materials you find. Uh, and that's actually the definition of open educational resources. And an important aspect in discovering and using open educational resources are open licenses. And we are therefore happy that Cable Green was willing to tell us more about this. Cable is Director of Open Education of Creative Commons, and he is a, passive, a passionate advocate of open education, and he is an expert on open licenses. And um, well, as uh, you can, as um, uh, Max already said, you can comment or ask questions using the chat window, and I want to give Cable the floor now. Great, thank you, Robert. Uh, can you hear me okay? Excellent. Very good. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And as I wrote in the chat, it's really nice to have a meeting with uh, wonderful people from all around the world and not have to get on an airplane. So I do appreciate that. Uh, I'm, uh, that's usually where I am, is on an airplane with a laptop, which is okay, too, but it's nice to be home every once in a while. <laughs> so I, uh, I'll go through a few points. And, but I'm going to keep my comments short because I'd much rather have a conversation. So please think about your questions, put them in the chat, and we'll talk as we go. Uh, so first, uh, before I dive into the licenses and what open means, um, a, a little bit of context. Um, we, we all live in a world which, uh, because of various forces, it continues to be a bit more closed, a bit more individualistic, um, and it's become a challenge to uh, to disaggregate some of the existing uh, systems and inertial forces at our institutions and act collectively. And that at its core is what we're trying to do at Creative Commons is we're trying to provide tools, legal tools, technology tools to enable us to work together to advance the collective good uh, in a no permission required space for people to innovate and create. So what Creative Commons is, uh, this is a nonprofit global organization that started in 2001, and we help everyone in the world that wants to share, to share their knowledge and their creativity 
with simple legal permissions uh, to make a more equitable, accessible, and innovative world. So we work uh, with all types of different communities uh, with our licenses and tools, uh, everything from open education uh, to open access research, open data, uh, science, arts and culture, uh, film, uh, and more. Um, there are approximately, uh, by Google's count, over 1.3 billion Creative Commons licensed works on the web. Uh, but Google also tells us that those are extremely conservative analytics, and we're working on getting better data, which I'll talk about in a minute. So, you know, what what we are, what you probably know Creative Commons for, is we are the open copyright licenses that the world uses to share. And so, to understand that, I'll give about 15 seconds on copyright. In in most countries in the world, when you create something, the moment that I I, I write down a paragraph on this piece of paper, it's automatically copyrighted. I don't have to file for copyright. I don't have to give paperwork to my government. I automatically have copyright on my work. And that means that I own it. And it also means that nobody else can perform the work or make copies of it or modify it or change it to meet their local needs. They can't translate it into a different language, et cetera. Now, some countries have exceptions to copyright. They're called fair use or fair dealing rights um, in most countries. And those are uh, exceptions to copyright, but those are increasingly under challenge as well. So what's, uh, what's, what's hard for all of us is we live in this world where we have the internet. And the works that we deal with uh, are, for the most part, digital. So pretty much everything we use in education has a digital file. And digital is interesting because we can store, copy, and, uh, and modify, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, store, copy, and distribute digital things at near zero cost. So we live in this world where, where uh, sharing collaboration, modifying, remixing is really easier to do technically than it ever has been in human history. And yet the laws, the copyright laws, uh, restrict our abilities to do that. And so this is where Creative Commons comes in. Creative Commons says, keep your copyright, keep your ownership. And if you choose to share with everyone else in the world, here is a, a license, an open license that you can put on your works and share those works under the terms and conditions that you choose. So that's the, those are the Creative Commons licenses. We have six of those. Uh, you've probably seen these around the web. Uh, they're called things like the CC BY license or the BY SA license. There's four kind of possible conditions for the licenses. Uh, one is called attribution. That's required on all the licenses. That means if you use my work, you have to give me credit. You have to say who the author is, where it is, what's the, what's the URL, uh, the title of the work, and the license. So it's easy to give attribution. We already do it in the academy. It's called citations. So it's something we're familiar with. Um, but that's required on, on any work you use that has a CC license. The other three conditions are optional. So share alike means if you take my work and you modify it, you have to change. You have to share your modified work under the same terms that I shared my work under. So everything on Wikipedia, for example, is under an attribution share alike license. <clears throat> the next option is called non-commercial. Non-commercial says you can use my work, you can modify it, you can use it for free, but you cannot make primary commercial use of the work, meaning you can't sell it. So you can't take my my non-commercial license work, put it on the web and sell it for, for money. There are other commercial uses as well that would be excluded. Uh, and then the last condition is called no derivatives. And no derivatives means you can use my work for free, but you can't modify it uh, and, and then share that modification with other people, which in education is one, we try to stay away from no derivatives as much as we can because educators change stuff. That's what we do. We, <laughs> we take somebody else's work and we modify it to meet our needs in our classroom. 
So that's just a, a very uh, tiny bit about uh, CC licenses. I'll keep my eye on the chat window if anybody wants to dive deep on a particular uh, license or ask questions, feel free, and I'll, I'll address those. Um, so a bit of pre the next topic is just a bit of practical information about how do you find CC licensed materials. And let me just grab my notes here, and I will share some links in the chat window uh, as we go. Okay, so let's see here. I'll just drop this in, and then you can read along with me. Okay, and there's some links for you as well. So there are many ways that people find uh, openly licensed materials on the web. Uh, one is that they find them on the platforms that they're already using, the technical platforms. So if you've been on Flickr to look for images, or if you're reading blog posts on Medium, or if you're um, on YouTube looking for videos, uh, or on SlideShare pulling down somebody's slide deck, uh, then what you'll see all over these platforms are, uh, in the case of Flickr, images that people have uploaded. And yes, some of them are all rights reserved copyright, but you'll also find public domain, and you'll find all the different C CC licenses on images in Flickr. And Flickr goes a step further and makes it easy for you to uh, filter the images you're looking for by the Creative Commons license that you'd like to use the image under. Same thing with Medium. YouTube allows for a CC BY license on, on videos uh, in addition to their regular license. SlideShare lets you choose any of the CC licenses. And then, of course, there are uh, OER repositories uh, all around the world. Um, there are several across Europe. India has its own repository. There's a couple in the UK. Uh, the United States has three big repositories. Canada has several. Uh, so they're, they're, And so does Brazil. And I mean, everybody's got OER repositories where they're starting to share this stuff. Um, there are, um, that, that's, a, that's both helpful and it's also a challenge because when people say, where do I find OER? There's no one answer. Um, and so that gets to the next point, which is curated lists. So one of the things that we're, uh, we're increasingly seeing in education is librarians are getting very involved with open educational resources. And I should define what I mean when I say OER. Uh, open educational resources are educational resources that are either in the public domain or they have an open license on them, which allows you to do what we call the five R's. And the five R's are the legal rights, the legal rights to retain, keep a copy, reuse the work, revise it or modify it somehow, remix it. So I can remix, take a little bit of this and a little bit of this and mash it together and create something new and redistribute it. So I have to be able to retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. And those are actually legal rights that the Creative Commons license gives you to do things with the work. So for something to be OER, it has to be both. It has to be free, and you have to have the legal rights to essentially modify it to meet your needs. <clears throat> so back to librarians. What they're starting to do is they're, uh, they're creating curated lists. So, uh, hey, here's at the Open University in the Netherlands, here's a set of OER for chemistry faculty. Uh, and we're increasingly seeing that. And that's a, a great service for the, the educators who are using it. Um, another uh, list that, um, that I, we put together a while ago, and I'll drop the link in again, this is just a list of many uh, OER spaces to look around the world uh, kind of by category. Um, this is also very clunky. This is not very user friendly. Um, and so then we get into search options. And so um, I'll just drop this back in the chat and I see your questions. I'll come back to them in a moment. Uh, we get into search. So can we do uh, meta searches of OER? And the answer is yes. Um, the other answer is the existing searches are not very good. So Creative Commons original search engine, the one that's active right now, you kind of are only searching a few repositories at, at once. It's, it's okay, but it's not great. Google advanced search, a little bit better, but you're also searching the entire web. And so you get, you're gonna get a lot of results, but you can sift your Google searches or filter your Google searches 
by CC licenses. You'll see that under usage rights at the bottom of advanced search. Um, this middle link here uh, for the, the, the ccsearch.creativecommons.org, that's our new beta search. And so what we're building at Creative Commons now is a couple new technical tools. One is we're building a database of the entire commons. And what we mean by that is we're going to have a database uh, of everything that's in the public domain and all the works on the web that have a CC license on them. Now that doesn't exist yet. Nobody has that. And so, and we've, we've asked others to build it over the past several years and nobody stepped up to do it. And so now we will do it. And what we are going to do is build that database and provide an open API to that database. So there will be an open data stream from it so that anybody who wants to build a service on top of that commons database can do so. Uh, but what we will do is we will use that API and create a new CC search. So the idea is that, and hopefully sometime in maybe late 2018, we will all be able to go to the new CC search and it'll be a one stop for searching the commons. And then the last uh, point here uh, under uh, how people find stuff, and I'll just drop it in and then we'll circle back to all these good questions, um, is that people ask for help on a regular basis of OER that they're looking for on email lists. And there are several really great uh, open education email lists around the world. And one of the nice things about open education is there's a very strong uh, community, global community, of people who want to help each other. And when somebody says, I'm looking for X, uh, somebody else around the world says, oh, I know where that is, or I've built that, or, um, or maybe it doesn't exist and we need to work together and create it. Okay, so that's, those are some places to find OER. Let me come back to these, uh, these questions here. So it looks like Robert asked the first one. Is there a big difference between a YouTube license and a CC BY license? Because that's the only one they let you use. Um, the answer is yes, there is a big difference. Um, so the YouTube license and the YouTube terms of service, uh, for example, uh, don't, lo don't let you uh, make a copy or download the video. Uh, the CC BY license does. So um, even though Google's terms of service says no download, um, if there's a CC BY license on the work, um, then the license says, yes, you can make a copy. Um, so that's, that's probably the biggest, uh, most meaningful difference. That said, it brings up another important issue, which is licensing is one thing, and then actually getting access to the file in an editable format where you can exercise your license rights is a whole nother deal. And YouTube's a good example where they don't make it easy for uh, for the public to download the videos in an editable format so you could do something with that video. So that's a kind of a half solution there. Um, Max says, what do you think about the NC license option? How restrictive is it? So Max, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, NC is important for a lot of uh, communities. Uh, in education, my opinion of it is that certainly it's available for anybody that wants to use it. it um, if we didn't if we didn't think it was useful and if the community didn't think it was useful, we wouldn't still offer it. So there, there is a, a significant amount of use of NC out there in the world, uh, and people have some strong reasons for wanting to use it. So let me start there. Um, in, it is also true that in education, um, NC uh, can cause a lot of confusion. So uh, it's quite common for, uh, for faculty at universities or uh, at community uh, colleges or TVECs and, or uh, or private um, uh, primary and elementary schools where tuition is charged, so where you're charging money to attend the school, uh, it's quite common for the faculty there to say, oh, well, we charge tuition, and therefore we can't use NC licensed content in my classroom because there's money exchanging hands to attend the university or to attend the particular school. Um, and of course, that's not that doesn't stop your use of NC. Um, a, a university that charges tuition could download the entire MIT curriculum, uh, in, which is NC licensed, and, and use it as long as you're not charging for the curriculum itself. Um, and so, but nevertheless, that confusion causes less use than we might have seen otherwise. Um, NC is also, uh, many people say, and, and uh, is that it's a bit vague. 
and it's designed to be a bit vague in and as the as the lawyers and others were writing the license uh, because that gives some flexibility about how people apply it and how it's interpreted but that's a double-edged sword um, it's not a it's it, whereas attribution is very clear about how you provide attribution non-commercial is a, a little bit more fuzzy and that can cause confusion in education as well um, and then the last thing i would say about nc is that um, in, in my time, almost six and a half years now at Creative Commons, um, what we see is that when people put a CC BY license or just the Creative Commons attribution license on work, we, we just don't see quote unquote commercial abuse of attribution licensed works. Um, and the main reason for that, and I've talked with many publishers about this, is that uh, the attribution requirement itself is a significant commercial deterrent. Because if, if I'm a commercial publisher and I take your CC BY licensed work and I put it on my website and try to sell it for 20 euros, um, I still have to legally give attribution back to you. So this was a CC BY licensed work that Robert put up. Uh, I'm Pearson, I'm trying to sell his, his work for 20 euros online. And any customer that comes to me is going to say, well, wait a minute, why did I spend 20 euros with Pearson when I can see clearly from the link that it's under a CC license, so I know it's freely available somewhere. And if I link over here to Robert, the original, who I trust more than I trust the publisher anyway, I can get it for free. Who's the customer mad at? They're really mad at, at the publisher. And so the publishers just don't, just don't do it. So when we... Uh, you know, when we're, when we're in education, we try to uh, share our works under the most permissive, least restrictive Creative Commons license possible so that other educators are, are not confused and that they have as much flexibility, as many legal rights as they can get to do what they need to do with the work. Let's see, John says, uh, why do we have a CC BY NC ND license? Isn't that almost the same as closed? <laughs> Um, it's getting pretty close to close. So yeah, John, um, we have the license because a few people still use it in certain circumstances. Um, it's, it's a very uh, restrictive license um, and there's still some use out there for it. We, uh, we don't use ND licenses in education uh, because they violate the, any, all the OER definitions. So they violate uh, the five R's. You can't revise or remix an ND license work. The, the caveat there is the 4.0 licenses do allow you to remix an ND work for yourself, for your own use, but you're not allowed to share that with anybody else, and so, which sort of defeats the point, right? If, I, if, I'm, if I'm engaged in open education and I'm remixing OER, I'm probably going to want to share it with my students or with somebody else. Okay, uh, John says, who are the police that make sure all open licenses are adhered to? Is there a mechanism uh, especially for education development. Yeah, so good question, John. Um, so no, um, there are no uh, there are no police other than the community. Um, and frankly, this is true of, of all rights reserved copyright as well. There's no police for all rights reserved copyright. Um, you've got things like WIPO, um, international organizations that uh, facilitate conversations around intellectual property rights, but they talk about both closed and open. Um, you've got, in fact, WIPO is starting to share their works under CC licenses. Um, you've got, uh, certainly on the commercial side, individual companies that will try to police the copyrighted use of their works quite strongly. Um, that's especially true in uh, music and in movies and other high value commercial entities that are copyrighted works. Um, certainly published textbooks would be another category where they would police their own works. Um, but the, uh, in the open community, uh, what, what tends to happen is when one of us, you know, any of us around the world, tens of thousands of us, when we see uh, a piece of OER where the, where the marking is not very good, so maybe somebody didn't provide good attribution, what we do as a community is we say, hey, that marking could be better and let me help you. Or, uh, or maybe, well, wait a minute, uh, you downloaded an OpenStax textbook and you have marked it with an ND license. You know, what's that about? They're, all of their works are CC BY. 
Uh, you can't do that. That's not the license on the original work. And so, you know, people in a very kind, usually kind and gentle way, say, uh, that's not okay, and here's how you fix it. Creative Commons, from time to time, gets pulled into three-party conversations. Not very often, but we're happy to do that when there's a, a dispute around the licenses. But I can tell you that happens really rarely. It doesn't happen very often. There's a lot of goodwill in the open education community. All right, John says there are two, uh, two types of licenses on YouTube. Yep, okay, good. Ben says, uh, it is often said that they prefer NC for their products in order to avoid commercial use by others, not only publishers. Um, yeah, so Ben, you're absolutely right. Um, I can, you know, I'll share my own personal story. I used to work for uh, the equivalent of TVETs in the United States. I worked for community and technical colleges. And my instinct when we launched, we, we built our, our general education curriculum as OER. It's called the Open Course Library. And... Um, we had to decide what license we were going to use, what Creative Commons license, when we built new original content. And so we looked at all the CC licenses, and my instinct was non-commercial. We're nonprofit uh, community and technical colleges. Of course it should be non-commercial. People shouldn't make money off our publicly funded works. But that was my first instinct. And my second instinct was share alike. Well, of course share alike. Uh, we were kind enough to share with you you should be forced to share your works or your revisions of our works with everybody else. The, the challenge with that, and I'll share, let me share another web link here real quick, is uh, when it comes to remix. So not all of the Creative Commons licenses can be remixed with all of the other Creative Commons licenses. So there's a, there's a link there in the chat window uh, to our remix chart. And where there's a green check, you can remix two different CC licenses. And where there's a black X, you cannot. And so if you look at the CC BY license, for example, you can remix it with everything except for the ND licenses. Whereas the other Creative Commons licenses have fewer remix opportunities. And so in the end, we decided in our project that if the point of education is sharing, if the point of sharing OER is to share it with as many people as possible and provide educators with as much flexibility as possible, then we should use the most flexible license that we can, which is the CC BY license. The only way to be more flexible than the CC BY license is to use our public domain dedication called CC0, where you actually give up your copyright and put the work into the public domain, in which case you can remix public domain with, with everything. Okay, uh, let me see if I got all the questions here. Is the CC repository going to be curated? Um, kind of. So what we're thinking, um, uh, Tommy, I think that's your name, Tommy, uh, is that is that we will um, we uh, we will initially reach out to repositories, OER repositories, and other repositories that are uh, have content used for educational purposes, and uh, which is, to be honest, most of the content in the world. Um, but we'll reach out to those repositories and, uh, and get feeds from them into the Commons repository. So for example, uh, we would reach out to the OER repository in India, and we would say, hey, would you be willing to give us an, a, a data feed uh, into our repository. And we, we know that they've got some mechanisms in the Indian OER repository to filter and curate, and then we benefit from their curation. Uh, we'll ask for a feed from OER Commons and Merlot and Connections and uh, the former Jorum in the UK and, uh, and repositories around Europe, uh, and then have conversations about when, with them about how they curate. So that's step one. We're also going to index the web and look for any place we can find public domain or, or CC license materials, and we'll, we'll bring that in as well. And then once we've got the database, which of course is an evergreen project, it will never end, um, we will use uh, machine learning, uh, you know, one of the forms of artificial intelligence, to have the, the results get smarter um, as people use the, use the database, as they use CC search and other tools. And then um, the the exchange, right? The quid pro quo is that Creative Commons will 
be happy to give you, anybody, a free feed to the Commons database to do whatever you want to do with the data. What we would ask in return is that you feed back to us some of the use data um, of your of your app or of your uh, of of the work that you're doing with the data, so that our database can get smarter and feed out things like curated sets of educational resources. So it'll be a it'll be a work in progress. Step one, honestly, is just to get the database of all CC licensed works, get good metadata on those works, uh, and everything that's in the public domain. That in and of itself will be huge, and that's what we're working on right now. And then Sunny says, students enrolled in our TVET programs in Nigeria pay some tuition. How do we handle that? So, um, so Sunny, charging tuition is fine. It doesn't affect the use of OER at all. You could use um, NC licensed materials uh, all day long and still charge tuition, and that's fine. What you cannot do with NC licensed materials is charge for the materials themselves. However, you can, you can, I want to be clear, you can take NC licensed content, give it to your bookstore or your printer at your university, and print those materials and sell those materials as long as it is at cost. So as long as there's no profit, you can cover your costs for the printing and the ink and the paper and overhead for running the bookstore. That's all fine. What you cannot do is make a profit or charge a profit for NC licensed printed OER. It's something that comes up quite common. It's another confusion around NC that exists in the education space. Uh, distinguish between tuition and education and fees. Oh, and fees for resources. Yeah, so Sunny, that's a good, or Tim, that's a good point. Um, if you are charging a materials fee, that is intended to pay for the content in the course, then uh, then you really could not use NC licensed content because by definition, you'd be charging for the content, if that makes sense. Ben's question has not been answered. What did Ben ask? Oh, here we go, uh, okay. One of the characteristics of TVED is collaboration between educational institutions and companies. How do CC licenses fit in, and what would you suggest? What would you suggest CC buy for products originate from these types of collaboration? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question. Um, let me give you an example of a huge project in the United States. Um, okay, actually, let me just take you straight to um, ah, what's it called? Skills Commons. So um, I'll give you an example from my country. Um, in the right after the economic crisis in 2008, um, uh, there were people who lost their jobs all around the world, including in in the United States. Um, tens of thousands of people uh, were fired uh, because of the economic crisis, um, and these tended to be people with lower skills in the economy. Um, the U.S. Department of Labor put $2 billion to the community colleges in the United States, um, to the, the equivalent of the TVETs, and gave them $2 billion, so that's a lot of money, and to 800 community colleges across the United States, and said, go build uh, with, with businesses, with companies um, in your sectors, go build uh, new degree programs where they're to teach people skills and competencies where there are jobs. So the the mining jobs were going away. The coal mining was going away, but there were new jobs in wind technology. The um, I don't know the certain other jobs were going away, but there were new jobs in advanced manufacturing. And so um, what the Department of Labor said was everything that's built with this money has to have a CC BY license on it. If you don't agree to CC BY, you can't have the money. And these were about $20 million grants, 20 million US. Um, all of that content is in the link, or most of it's there, more of it's coming in now, at skillscommons.org. So that's an example where the government said, if you take public money, you have to put a CC BY license on what you build. Now, here's a bunch of money, and go work with industry and business 
and business and industry, frankly, was was fine with this, and, and they were really happy with the CC BY license requirement because they got two things. Um, one was they got some money from the grant to help the community college build content to build the OER. So they were happy about that because they got some cash. They were also happy about the CC BY license because they got to take a copy um, under a very permissive license to use that, that OER internally in their business. Whereas had that, that license requirement not been there, it was very likely that the community college would have retained all rights reserved copyright and, and the business would not necessarily have had access to the content. And so it worked out quite well. We call those open licensing policies, which is not part of today's talk, but interesting nevertheless. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Tim. In Canada, there is something called the BC Open Textbooks Project at BC Campus, which is awesome. Maybe somebody could put in the link for the, the BC Open Textbooks Project. All right, great questions. Keep them coming. I'll try to, I'm trying to get to the list that Robert gave me so that Robert doesn't get angry with me. Because uh, if I'm honest, I'm a little, I'm a little afraid of Robert. Uh, let's see here. Um, so Robert wanted me to talk a bit and Max a bit about the difference between free and open. We've, we've talked a little bit about that. Um, as you know, the majority of MOOCs out there in the world um, are free admission. Uh, they're, they're, they're free in the sense of you're not charged tuition, um, but they're not open because most MOOCs out there are not uh, openly licensed uh, or they're not in the public domain. And for something to be open educational resources, it has to be both. You have to have free access to it and you have to have the legal rights to do those five R's. You have to be able to retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. And why do we care? What's, you know, why do we care free versus open? Well, you know, think about, um, let's say you find a really great future learn course, a really great Coursera course or Udacity course that, that you really like and you want to use. Um, and you want to revise it and you want to download it to your university. Uh, if it's not openly licensed, you don't have the legal rights to do it. All you can really do is link to it, uh, but that doesn't let you modify it or change it or host a copy or print copies of it out. Right? You're just not allowed to do those things. So, so it matters. When you actually are trying to do things with content, if you don't have the legal rights to do it, um, then that's a major, it's a major problem. All right, uh, let's see here. Um, let me finish up one more point and then I'll just stop and we'll just talk about the questions here. <laughs> um, one other topic, so two final things for me. Uh, one other topic is, um, is this one. It's oftentimes called uh, open education practices or uh, David Wiley calls it OER enabled pedagogy. It's called different things. Um, sometimes it's called open praxis. But the idea is that um, when the content you're working with is openly licensed, you can do different things with the, the pedagogy or the practices in your class. Now, it's not just about the licensing of the content. It's, it's about freedom, and it's about student involvement, and it's about co-creation of knowledge. Uh, and it's about people becoming citizen scientists and collecting data and sharing that data openly. It's about all sorts of things. People have different definitions. But at its core, it's, you know, in education spaces, we can, if we're thinking and we're acting in an open way, if we go into the education experience with the expectation of sharing, with the expectation that I will share with you everything that I am creating, if there's an expectation that you'll also share with me, if there's an expectation that we're going to share power, if you will, we're going to share the responsibility and the rights to change things, to improve things, to create, to innovate. Um, that's what we're talking about. Now, it's really helpful in that space if the content is either in the public domain or openly licensed, because, of course, in education, we have textbooks and course packs and and simulations and videos and audio and all these different content artifacts that we use. And if we're going to co-create and innovate and build together and share, it's almost impossible to do those things, to take those collaborative actions 
if the content is locked down all rights reserved copyright. It becomes it becomes very difficult. Um, and so there was a great, uh, the link that I included here is a, a blog that David Wiley just wrote yesterday uh, because um, in the United States, and we're seeing this increasingly in Europe uh, and some in Africa as well, the publishers are trying to make the argument that OER is about cost. It's about cost, cost savings. And that's really its value proposition. And if that's true, then we, the publishers, hey, we can solve that problem. We can make uh, our educational resources that we sell you much less expensive. They're not going to be free, but they'll be affordable. And there we go. We've solved the problem. All students have access to the resources on day one. Uh, they've, they've got really great content. And so you don't need OER anymore. And that's essentially their argument. And what David's post is talking about is if we, the open education community, if we only talk about cost, if we only talk about cost savings of OER, and, and, and make no mistake, there are significant cost savings with OER. So we should do it for efficiency reasons. We should do it to save students money. We should do it. It, it makes sense for the US Department of Labor to require a CC BY license on a $2 billion grant because now the TVETs in the Netherlands and in Germany can take all of that content from skillscommons.org and use it legally. And that's a good thing. We want to see more of that in the world. So yes, they should do those things. But the, the big reason we want to do open education is around transforming education spaces to be those collaborative, innovative, collective action spaces that, that excites students, that motivates students, and frankly, excites faculty as well. Okay, so let me, uh, enough, I'll get off my, uh, my grandstand. And then one last thing for me, and then I'm going to go to the questions. Um, and the last thing for me is a invitation and an ask. So, so this is your homework for everybody watching this video. Your homework is to join the Creative Commons Open Education platform. Um, so this is, it's free. This costs no money. Um, this is a space where uh, we just passed, in fact, two days ago, uh, 600 people from all around the world, I think we're up to 40 or 50 countries now, um, have signed up to be part of a, a collaborative, collective action space to have international conversations about open education. And what we mean by talking about open education is we're gonna work on projects um, that have to do with OER, with content, with uh, OEP or practices, open education practices, and policy. So things like asking national governments to require uh, CC by licensing on all publicly funded educational resources would be one example of policy. Uh, there are other examples as well. So that's what we're going to work on. We are only going to work on projects that are multinational. So we're not going to work on a project just for the province of Alberta or just for the Netherlands or just for Belgium. We're happy to work with Belgium and the Netherlands, but it has to be a project for multiple countries. So uh, so please do sign up. We need your good ideas. Um, I'm sure that we don't have some of the countries that are represented here on today's webinar, and I would love to have you come and be a representative from your nation. Um, and uh, it's an, uh, we meet monthly. There's a listserv. There's a Slack uh, channel uh, for instant messaging. Um, you can also use IRC if you prefer. Um, and w there will be real money put on these projects. So we're, we're spinning up projects right now, project ideas. Uh, people will propose those. We will vote on them collectively. So everybody will get one vote and uh, we'll decide what we want to fund. And then projects that are not voted to the top, some of us may still want to do those uh, as groups, as international groups, and we'll seek outside funding for those. So please do sign up if you haven't already. All right, uh, so let me come back to the questions. Actually, let me stop talking for a minute and take a drink and ask my hosts if they would like to chime in for a moment, and then I'll be happy to go back to the questions.
Thank you, uh, Cable. Uh, it was inspiring. Uh, and there are actually a lot of questions uh, talked, and you answered already a lot of questions, uh, which uh, even um, although I'm, um, yeah, I know, I know uh, uh, your subject, but uh, every time you amaze me there by t uh, telling me something I didn't know already. <laughs> so that's, uh, <laughs> so that, that's nice. Um, uh, the majority of the, uh, uh, or the, uh, uh, apart from the, from from the rather practical questions like uh, uh, where to find them and and, and, and uh, uh, giving the links about uh, those search things, uh, also some, well, I, I call them wicked questions. And one of those questions I see here in the um, in the forum is is is, is from Tami. Could you talk about OER business models? And that's that's something I guess the whole world is still struggling with. Uh, but because, yeah, left or right, when you when you uh, publish open uh, educational resources, so uh, it costs them to develop them. It costs to develop them. It costs to um, to have them uh, in the air. There's, there are server costs uh, involved, and so and someone has to pay for it. And could you uh, talk about uh, something of these um, uh, a little? Yes, I, I'd be happy to. Um, so first, let me share two resources, and then I'll then I'll give you my take on business models. So the first resource I shared is a book that Creative Commons wrote called uh, Made with Creative Commons. And the whole point of the book is um, it's a set of case studies about businesses, not just in education, but across different sectors of society who use Creative Commons. They share the, the works under a CC license for free with the public. But then they also have a, a business model that goes along with that. So for example, the Noun project is a, a project online, maybe somebody could drop the link in, that, uh, that has icons, uh, really elegant, beautiful, simple icons that people use in their slide presentations or sometimes on billboards on a, on a freeway. Um, and if you want to use them for free, the attribution is sort of stamped into the, the image of the icon. And if you want to remove the attribution and, and not provide attribution to the work, you pay a little money. And that money, a little bit goes to the noun project, uh, to the platform, and a little bit of that money goes to the artist who created the icon. And so that's, that's just one example of a business model um, where they've, you know, they've, they've created some value. Another example, which I thought was fascinating, was about building furniture. And so there's, uh, there's a, a case study where there are uh, uh, artists, uh, designers who design furniture. They CC license their designs for how to build a couch or how to build a table. Um, and, and anybody in the world can take those CC licensed uh, furniture designs and you can go to your garage and build the table. And that's fine. Most people don't have a workshop in their garage. Most people don't have the time or the expertise to build a table. They want to, you know, I'm in the Netherlands. I live in Delft. I want to go down to my local uh, wood maker and I want to give him these designs and let him build the table. And when that happens, the wood maker collects money from me for the table. The wood maker or the, the, that artist, that artisan gets some money. Some of the money goes back to the platform and some of the money goes to the designer. And so there are these interesting new flows of money that sustain businesses uh, and yet the, the work itself is CC licensed. So that's, that's, that's one example is that book has those case studies. Uh, the, the second link I shared here was a study uh, that was just done in Brazil and uh, Priscilla and I from Brazil just wrote a blog post on this. Um, and this is uh, an interesting study as well. I'm not going to go into it. I'll let you read it if you're interested. Uh, but it's got some interesting connections to what the governments of the world just talked about recently in Slovenia at the OER Global Congress. So I'll let you read the blog post. Uh, here, here's my opinion. Um, in education, um, as, when it comes to business models, um, my starting point is that all countries in the world have an interest in educating their citizens. <clears throat> it doesn't matter what country you go to, every country cares 
about uh, an education for its citizens. It's also true that every country in the world spends a significant amount of money on public education uh, in primary, secondary, and tertiary education. Uh, they do it in different ways. Uh, in some countries, tuition is free at universities. In some countries, like in my country, it's very, very expensive. And the debt in uh, the student debt has just passed 1.4 trillion US dollars in the United States because tuition is so expensive. And, and not just tuition, but textbooks as well. And so, uh, but the United States spends hundreds of billions of dollars a year on uh, on financial aid for for tuition, for books, for all sorts of other expenses, um, as do other countries. And so my starting point is that there is a there's a lot of money at national government levels and at provincial and state levels and at local uh, town or district levels, uh, oftentimes collected through property taxes on people's homes that is spent on public education. So step one, in my opinion, is to it, to go into a what you know a particular country and do that analysis. Ask the question: How much money do we spend in Germany on hot, on universities for students? How much money do we spend in Germany on primary and secondary schools? Just ask the question. The second question is: Where does that money go? Where, where is it going? Is it going to publishers? Are we paying our teachers to build content? The third question is: um, Is is that an efficient use of the money? So I'll give you an example. In my country. Uh, we spend approximately 10 billion, so that's billion with a B, we spend about $10 billion a year buying curriculum for primary and secondary schools, public schools. So we call that K-12, uh, kindergarten through grade 12. That's a lot of money, $10 billion a year. For that, what we get on average are materials that are about 10 to 12 years old, uh, it's usually paper only, no digital. Uh, the the school children are not allowed to keep a copy. It's all rights reserved content. Uh, because it's out of date, it needs to be fixed and updated. It has errors in it, but because it's all rights reserved uh, and we have these paper copies from the publishers, nobody can update it. A, it's paper, and B, it's all rights reserved, so we don't have the legal rights to change it. Um, if somebody loses one of those books, their parents have to spend on average 150 US dollars to replace it. And so if you're if you're poor, if you're somebody who doesn't have a lot of money, uh, you, you, you can't replace it, you don't have the money. And so you tell your kids horrible things like you cannot take your book from home to school and back because you might lose it. So you need to go make friends with a rich kid and go to their home and do homework every day. I mean, it's absolutely insane what we get in the United States for $10 billion a year, right? So you have to do this analysis in any particular country and you have to follow the money. Now, I, I will warn you, this is a risky thing to do because the vested interests in government and in business do not like this analysis. They will try to stop you. They will try to feed bad data, but you have to do it. This is the only way to start the conversation. And then once you know where the money is spent and you know what results you're getting for the money, then you can have the conversation about uh, what if we what if we did it open instead? So just take my country as an example. How much money would it cost? So in the United States, primary and secondary is 12 or 13 grades, kindergarten plus 12 grades. Then you graduate, then you go to college, you go to university. So how much would it cost to build 13 grades of about eight subjects per grade? because we've got about eight subjects in each grade. So that's that's a grid of about 100 cells. If I So if I had a, a Google spreadsheet or an Excel spreadsheet, it'd be about 100. I don't know, is it a million dollars per course? Is it $10 million per course? I don't know, let's be obnoxious and call it $10 million a course. So 10, I have to, somebody do the calculation for me <laughs> in the chat. What's, what's $10 million times 100? That would be, what is that, $1 billion? That's $1 billion. <laughs> It's $1 billion, right? So, okay, that's a lot of money, but let's spend $1 billion 
And maybe we need five versions of everything because, you know, we don't want the government telling everybody what they need to teach. So let's have five versions of everything. And it's all CC by license. Let's spend five billion dollars once. Well, we're already spending ten billion dollars every year and getting terrible results. We could spend five billion dollars once and give everybody five versions for free under a CC by license that they could all edit. And so Texas could edit it the way they wanted to. And New York could edit it the way they wanted to. And they start with five different versions from the get go. And then because and, and then let's spend, let's provide public money. Um, let's provide 25 percent maintenance contracts to keep that content up to date every year. And so we will give it. And I'm not saying that the, that the public schools are going to build any of this content. We'll put out open requests for proposals to, frankly, the world. So if the if the math department at the Open University of the Netherlands provides the best proposal and the best content to build sixth grade algebra, then we will hire them to, we'll give them uh, whatever the number is, uh, 10 million US dollars to build sixth grade algebra, and we'll give them 2.5 million US dollars to keep sixth grade algebra up to date every year. So you get where I'm going with this, right? Instead of 10 billion, we're going to spend five billion once, and we're not going to spend ten billion a year every year going forward like we do today. We're going to spend twenty-five percent of of ten billion. We're going to spend two and a half billion a year. So now our savings are seven and a half billion dollars a year in my country, and every kid has up-to-date resources. Everybody gets to keep a copy. We've got everything is digital and print. Um, it's available in multiple technical formats. It's under a CC by license. The innovation can happen in a classroom. We can do open educational practices. There's no problem if you're rich or poor. You get a copy. If you lose a copy, here's another digital version, right? So there is no losing a digital copy. And if you lose your printed copy, we can print them for $5. Go, go pick up another one in the corner. You don't even have to tell your parents, oh, you want to take your materials from grade six algebra into grade seven pre-calculus, go for it, keep a copy, right? And so like, don't, you know, I get angry about this. It's like, don't talk to me about, can we do business models that are sustainable? The proper way to look at this, I think, is to say what we do today with public money in any particular country is irresponsible, inefficient, and uh, and we are being bad stewards of public money. And if we were, we can still take a whole bunch of public money and give it to the commercial space to build what we need, but under different conditions. And the new conditions should be that when public money is spent to publisher X, the public, the government should hold the copyright. The publisher should be work for hire. So we'll pay you really well, but you don't own it the government of Germany or the government of the Netherlands holds the copyright and the government puts a CC by license on it and shares it with everybody else. So that's, sorry to be long winded, but that's my answer to sustainable business models. We still have businesses, but to be totally honest, the market gets a lot smaller. So in the United States, the market's no longer 10 billion a year. The ongoing market in the United States for primary and secondary schools, probably about two and a half billion a year. Same thing in higher education, shrinks from about 10 billion to about two and a half billion. And that, in my opinion, would be a proper use of public money. Yes, there are fewer publishers probably, but to be honest, that's not our problem. Our problem is how can we help governments have efficient and effective procurement models of educational resources and services that meet our needs as, as stewards of public money? That's our job. Whether or not businesses change or fall or new ones are created, the market will take care of that. Our job is to be fair and open in the request for proposals that we put out and make those competitive and open. And then the best the best vendors will step forward. There, I'm, I'm done with my speech. <laughs> Thank you very much, Cable. Um... I guess we are also at the end of this webinar because we are now uh, uh, we are planned to do this in an hour. Uh, uh, there is an, uh, this was a uh, very compelling argument, Cable. You you ended your speech with, and I see in the chat that there are uh, there is a lot of interest in it. Uh, I know 
you you have uh, presented on this. I guess it was at the open net in Banff, but I'm not so sure about this. So I can look for the for the slides, but I don't know if you also have have a note on this or, or, uh, or has this uh, written in paper. Maybe you can send it to me, and then we can uh, share it on on the, on the forum. Um, well, thank you again, uh, and uh, thank you all participants uh, for the for your uh, participation and a lot of questions you you posed. Uh, we can. Um, uh, this uh, webinar was recorded, and we uh, will share the recording on the on the forum as soon as uh, possible. And we can continue our discussions on this forum. We've posted an initial statement uh, with a couple of questions, and we can use these questions as a starting point for our discussions. But we can also use uh, all the uh, all the information which came uh, on on this uh, webinar and discuss further on the topics uh, cable addressed. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, have a nice day, evening, afternoon. What uh, um, uh, yeah, what place in the world you are living in? And hope to see you uh, uh, in the next webinar, which will be in a week, um, with uh, Alison Meet Richardson, uh, Pauline Whiteman, uh, and it's and uh, maybe some other people also telling about uh, good practices and lessons learned from uh, implementations of OER in TVET. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everybody.